Johan Beanie fans and welcome to Amore Reaming. I had a bit of an episode the other day where I had to drink some milk and cocoa to prevent myself from using a bearing puller on my rectum. Remember to hit me up on Patreon and visit the website and on Instagram. Anyway, we digress. Now my Facebook and Instagram lit up just like the SpaceX rocket four minutes after launch about a carbon fiber molded bottom bracket. Now, let me just check the pen is working. Oh, it's working. Now, to be clear, this is the second iteration of this presentation. I did the first one and the subjective party got in touch. So I have to, you know, pat them on the back for doing that. Um, and I, uh, they clarified a few things. So I've, I've adjusted it and then I redid it. Now, before I go any further, I will admit I am a skeptic because my background has been in metal and I've lived through a, a time where carbon fibre fan blades came out the first time around and then government intervention in the form of a financial bailout was required. So I am biased based on history. I don't think it'll work, but I wish them well because I do think this is proper innovation. Bye, I'm Beanie, age five. Usual disclaimer, um, if you own the picture and care, drop me a line and I'll put a credit in the uh, note box below. Right, bit of background. So this is a carbon fiber threaded bottom bracket and it was made by a company called Bridge Bike Works in Toronto, Ontario in Canada. This is their website. They proudly produce their bikes in North America, uh, soon to be followed by Time Bicycles, no less. So Tony, if you are watching, I'll see you at Eurobike. This is a page about their bottom bracket. Um, you can read all about it and I'll, you know, I'll talk you th through this as we go. Um, there's, th this is like, kind of like the marketing spiel or why they're doing it. I mean, there's some things in here that I look at straight away and think, eh, th this is a bit of a, a push in towards a bit far from the truth. Perfect alignment. Now, if I was gonna be pedantic, your alignment isn't perfect. And in a threaded joint, you know, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll carry on with that. Corrosion resistant, yeah, I'll probably take that. Um, more simple, um, so fewer joints. I'd, I'd argue this is looking at a problem that shouldn't exist, but there you go. Um, the other thing is um, on this page. Now, I found this page quite interesting. So these are the two guys that um, run the business. So it was Frank who contacted me. So thank you to Frank for doing that. When I look through here, um, a couple of on their a couple of their engineers are what's known as PNG. Now, PNG, uh, you may not be familiar with, but it's a very high level of qualification, and that means you've been vetted. Now, PNG is the the Canadian one. The US equivalent is PE, which is professional engineer, and the UK equivalent is CNG, which is chartered engineer. Chartered engineer is a protected title, which means you cannot use it without having an engineering license from the engineering council. Now, very few people um, in the bike industry, and I haven't met any, um, have that. So, you know, that's something that, that's very unusual, but very good. This might be irrelevant, but I put it on here for completeness. Generally speaking, in metal, there are two ways to make threads, um, which involves, you know, rolling threads or cutting threads. Now, to roll threads, you, get the material and you're effectively compressing it through a series of metal dies and that compresses the thread into the material. The other way, which is probably the way that most people perceive it, is cutting the threads and that's just a picture of um, a shaft being turned on a lathe. There is a, a difference between the two, two end results. Now this is a section that depicts the difference, um, sort of material terms. On a cut thread, the sliced material, which is assumed to be isotropic, effectively you're slicing the layers away. So previously you'd end up with that and you take that material away and you're left with these peaks and troughs. Now on, the, um, on a roll thread, the layers are compressed to take the thread form. So you can see compression around here, compression of all those layers. Um, that is much, much stronger, significantly stronger, and it's much less likely to strip, and it has better fatigue resistance. So if you've got the choice, you pick the roll thread on most scales. 
Now, if you were to go into a very tiny scale, it would probably be dimensionally less accurate than a cut thread. The cut thread is basically like the knife going through it, whereas this is compacting it into shape. Now, this is a video which I lifted from, I think it was David Arthur's website. I can't remember. Anyway, um, it depicts their bottom bracket, so the bridge, the Bicycle Works bottom bracket, having a ceramic speed bottom bracket installed into it. There she is. Right, I've tried to depict the consequences of laying up material and then cutting threads and then moulding the threads as well. Now the blue stuff represents the resin um, and the orange bits are the fibres and this is not to scale. These orange fibres are typically 10 microns or 0.01 millimetres and the thread pitch on T47 is like one millimetres. So you would typically get on the one mil you'd be able to get a hundred of the fibers in between in the gap. Um, yeah. Now you could, there's a few ways to do this. I'm not necessarily saying that this is the way the bridge bicycle works do it because you know, they've got a patent going on it. I don't expect them to go into every song and dance detail about it um, for commercial reasons. Now you could have this picture on the left where you have lots of material and then cut them away and then fill the rest in with resin. So this is what you've basically got over here and you cut all of that away. Yeah, might have to just erase the ink on the slide. Um, now, the problem with that is you'll end up going from there to this scenario here. So you can see these cut fibers on the end and that has a tendency to fray. So that is a bit of a problem. Now, Bridge have said they mold the fibers into the thread so you don't have that cutting. Um, these are the statements they made. I, I've, I've copied them verbatim. Um, and they, they cop, you know, contacted me on Instagram to, to say that. Um, now, when I looked at this thing, the big thing for me was compaction. So I've, I've obviously drawn up T47 as a schematic, one millimeter thread pitch. If you take it as a 60 degree thread form, um, you've got, Bit, oh, you know, just a bit less than one mil there. It's going to be, either, I think it's the square root of 0.667. Can't remember, might be 0.707. It's 0.7 millimeters, whatever the number is. Now, I think you would have, I think you would be hard pressed to get decent compaction in the peak of the thread, um, especially at the tip under normal circumstances. Now they said they debulk um, here on multiple occasions, which essentially means they ram the fibers down to get rid of the voids. Um, and they also said if there are any um, imperfections, it acts like a flute on a thread. Um, so it, the debris gets out of the way. You know, that's what they've said. Now, after they've done all that, they, um, they put a ceramic coating on the, the outside. Um, ceramic coatings are there usually to give hardness or reduce friction, um, but they tend to be somewhat brittle. I'm not quite sure how long they'll last in this kind of environment. Threaded connections are inherently inaccurate, so this leads me back to the point where they said perfect alignment. You, you can't have perfect alignment in the threaded connection because the female and male parts um, have a rate, have a clearance, otherwise you wouldn't be able to screw them together. Uh, and this causes, you know, you, you could be, because they're not perfect, perfectly aligned, when you screw it up, you're basically acting on one pair of threads, at least, well, okay, it's a helix, but you might have a gap and teeth engagement is not 100%. So you'll end up basically twisting it so that they all touch, but adding a little bit more um, flexion uh, on, on each teeth until they all touch. That in itself causes, um, you know, is an area of misalignment. Now, uh, in, in metal, metal's a ductile material, it'll just generally deform to that shape. Carbon isn't, it will be usually just grind itself to that shape, which is completely different to bending. Now, one of the easiest ways to make um, you know, to mitigate that misalignment is to make the space between the two ends bigger. So historically, 
if you look at BSA, so what Specialized used, uh, use now, and also Cannondale, that gap there is 68 millimeters. And you've got this nice, big, fat, juicy 11 millimeters either side for your, your tool engagement. What people are going to now, like Trek, Trek's been pushing hard, is instead of it being 68, it's now, in this case of Trek, it's like 85 and a half, but everyone else is using 86 and a half. Okay, so they make that gap wider, so that radial misalignment, because of sine, cos, and tan, is reduced. The disadvantage with that is you only end up with like two millimeters, if that, for your tool to bite onto. These are some shots of the mold and the threaded insert. Now I think this has a broken helix you know, right here. I suspect that because a full helix would have been a ridiculous pressure to get it to go all the way around the entire spiral. I mean, I could be wrong, I'm going off the pictures, so bear that in mind. This next slide, this is a comparison between 7075 aluminium and carbon fiber and epoxy. Now the ultimate UTS, which is the um, ultimate tensile stress, uh, or um, is not that different between, um, I've picked the number up here, but 600, so let's say it's Torre 600 and um, uh, 7075 aluminium. Um, I mean, that, that number is just an arbitrary number. Don't take it as gospel by any means. Um, just re but just remember, you see, aluminium is an isotropic material, so it has the same properties in every direction. Carbon fiber doesn't. You have to layer the material on top of each other to give you the strength. So in just one direction, it's not really that strong. You need multiple layers to, to give you the strength. Um, now, in shear, the pure carbon fiber isn't that strong um, because you have to add on the variability of the resin. Mm because that gives you the, it's a, it's a composite structure. So the matrix needs the setting agent, which is the resin, and then that adds up. So if you add all that together and average it out, and bear in mind, I haven't done any specific calculations, um, you would probably end up being stronger with an aluminium insert. Just bear in mind though, if you put an aluminium insert into a carbon fiber bike, you still have got that bond joint. So overall, the strength is probably stronger with this type of bottom bracket because you've got rid of one interface. Now I would argue that if you put the bearings directly into the frame, that is your ultimate strength, but we've got this anyway. Right, this is a picture of the, um, of the threads. Now you can clearly see this area at the back where the thread appears to be distorted. Now my worry here is if this happens to you in the field, I doubt a tap would fix that. Now on metal, it would usually bring it back to in line, uh, make it usable because it's ductile, but you don't have that option with carbon fiber. Um, now I have got some metal inserts that I make. So these are my shells that I've actually made for a chap in New Zealand. Um, he's got, uh, well, two bits, two bikes. Colnago bike, which is going to use a BSA shell, which is this one here, um, and uh, I guess his custom bike, which is going to be T47, which is this one at the back. And they're both engineered kind of the same way, so in order to maintain the alignment, what I've done is I've made that an interference fit, and he needed that rather than one piece so he could get it in the bike frame, and that's like a common theme, so there's an overlap in there as you push it down it'll engage into that locating spigot and that'll get you there. It is not as good as a one piece. You've got some inaccuracy from machining the faces, machining the um, diameters and you know, a fitting inaccuracy as well. But it's gonna be better than, uh, better than having them completely independent. So having that. This is the same thing, but it's just a different size. So the 68 mil Colnago, again, that has an interference fit. Um, is is the T47 just shrunk down, or you could say the T47 was that on steroids. Now, if you look at the threads on here, they are cut, they are not rolled. I've never seen a bottom bracket, well, in, main, in mainstream circles, that is rolled on the ID, so the, uh, the, the bit that goes in your bike. Um, they're all usually generally always cut. A lot of the time they're cut in two independent sides and then glued in and then you've lost that locating spigot 
Um, this one is, yeah, it's cut in two sides, but you've got the locating spigot so that it should maintain a decent level of alignment. The ultimate torque this can take will require a pure tension test. Um, what they said is, what Bridge Cycle Works, Bridge Bicycle said, is um, they had their spline tool fail uh, at the top uh, rather than, you know, a defined torque test. So, you know, that's not me having a go. That is just a statement of fact. And that's to, probably to do with the two millimeter of tool engagement that sticks out on T4786. Um, I think the layer, um, thread layer on this, so this statement number two is gonna be problematic. I just can't see it happening. Um, and the misalignment, you know, this perfect misalignment we go to, it, in carbon fiber is usually caused by thermal shrinkage and non-allowance of that shrinkage when you make it. Um, now the press fit standard is generally 0.1 millimeters or 0.05 millimeters. I have doubts whether this will achieve that. Uh, if they want to send me one so I can check it, you know, by all means, I'd be more than happy to do so. And then this is the big one. This is one of those innovations, and it is an innovation, to a problem that should not exist. You know, put the bearings directly into the carbon fiber, and that's the end of the story. But now we've got an interface and tolerance stack up. The, this is just crazy, in my opinion, that we've got to this stage where people can't make a bike frame with a round hole in it. All you've got to do is basically make the round hole smaller than you need and then bore it out at the end. And then you'll have very accurate, no problem, no joints, none of this. And that's where I think, you know, that's where I think the industry has failed and people as consumers, I think they're a lot more wary of it now than they perhaps were five or six years ago. Um, but you know, that's where we go. Right, that is the end of this presentation. If you did enjoy it, remember to smash that like button. If you didn't, go screw yourself. And as always, keep banging your hairdresser.